Yes. No? Don't worry. Es, es el único power. Sí, de hecho. Sí, sí me ayuda. Gracias, Emilio. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us in the, the formal presentation of um, uh, the working group on access to information. As you know, we had a working session, a preparation session yesterday, and out of that, uh, we're going to have the following content or outlined for our presentation. Um, Gerardo Laviaga, the President Commissioner of uh, the Mexican Federal Institute for Access to Information, is gonna give us the welcoming words and introductions. Uh, then I will present to you the reasons why we thought uh, that the, within the framework of OGP and Access to Information Working Group was necessary. We will then have a, a Kevin Dunion uh, to uh, elaborate on the needs for uh, a work working group like this. Uh, Laura Newman 
is going to talk about the guiding principles and the potential groups that we're going to be forming out of this effort. Uh, and then uh, we're going to be uh, honored by um, a, a couple of people from government who are going to be joining us, and they're going to share their uh, experiences and expectations around access to information in OGP. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, a minister from Brazil and a minister for, from Georgia. Uh, we're going to have then also um, the participation of uh, the president commissioner of uh, Chile, who is just arriving, Jorge. Tenemos lugar para ti acá. And um, uh, finally, uh, Moises Sanchez is going to share with uh, all of us next steps. So please, after we say hello, we can start, Gerardo. No, no, you can. ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Soy Gerardo Laveaga. Ya me presentó Juan Pablo Guerrero. Soy el comisionado presidente del Instituto Federal de Acceso a la Información de México. Hoy en la mañana escuchábamos todos al primer ministro Cameron. Citaba el libro de Asemoglu y Robinson, Why Nations Fail, ¿Por qué fracasan las naciones?, y él hablaba de instituciones extractivas, que son estas instituciones formadas por muy pocas personas que se benefician del trabajo de muchas, de muchas, de muchas personas y de las instituciones inclusivas, que son estas instituciones que permiten que todos trabajen y construyan juntos un país. Cuando yo tengo que hablar, o en el momento en que tengo que hablar de por qué México y por qué el IFAI se han comprometido tanto con la OGP, bueno, me parece que es fundamental crear más instituciones inclusivas. Un gobierno bien intencionado tiene que trabajar hombro con hombro con la sociedad. En mi país, y supongo que en el de muchos de ustedes, hay quienes ven a las uh, ONGs como opositoras al gobierno. Yo no creo que sean opositores, creo que son aliados, que tienen que ser aliados y que nosotros tenemos que hacer todo lo que está en nuestras manos para que sean aliados. Repito, en el caso en que los gobiernos estén procediendo de buena fe y realmente quieran lo mejor para sus países. Si no es así, bueno, tendrán que ser oposición y hallarán mucha oposición. Yo quiero decir que el IFAI está muy complacido por la forma en que los gobiernos han trabajado en este sentido, particularmente el gobierno de México, y también quiero expresar que el desafío más importante tendrá que ser cultural, convencer a los gobiernos de que tenemos que trabajar, repito, hombro con hombro para este propósito. Tenemos muchos socios en este esfuerzo, concretamente para hablar de Access to Information Working Group. Eh, y quiero agradecer a las siguientes personas el trabajo que han realizado. Primero a Moisés Sánchez, del Regional Alliance for Freedom Information. También a Jorge Hagi, que está por reunirse con nosotros, el Contralor General de Brasil. A Laura Newman, del... Carter Center, gracias Laura, a Kevin Donion del Center for Freedom of Information, uh, a Jorge Jaraquemada, eh, que preside el Consejo Chileno para la Transparencia. También quiero agradecer particularmente a The World Bank Institute por el soporte, el apoyo que ha dado a este esfuerzo. No los, no los distraigo más y dejo la palabra a Juan Pablo Guerrero, para que coordine el, el evento, Juan Pablo, ah, ahí está Juan Pablo, para que coordine este evento y él, él llevará la, la palabra. Juan Pablo, por favor.
Gracias. Let me quickly share with you the objectives. But let me, since you have already, ya tienen sus micrófonos, keep them. Me facilita la vida. Y eh, ustedes no tienen que movérselos. Tanto los principales objetivos de crear un grupo de trabajo en torno a acceso a información en la Alianza para el Gobierno Abierto eh, es proveer una fuente de apoyo para ayudar a los gobiernos y a sus socios de sociedad civil a lo largo de las fases de la vida del de, eh, gobierno abierto para eh, asegurar que se plantean eh, objetivos o compromisos en materia de acceso a información que son efectivos, que son ambiciosos y que la información que se revela eh, al público es eh, significativa, es eh, importante para este. Pues, una fuente de apoyo en los esfuerzos en materia de acceso a información de los gobiernos que componen la Alianza para el Gobierno Abierto. Y en segundo lugar, eh, para eh, dar el, el eh, apoyo necesario a todos los actores que en nuestra experiencia tienen que estar involucrados eh, para eh, los compromisos de acceso a información en gobierno abierto. Hemos visto que a pesar de que hay compromisos en el marco de gobierno abierto, no hay muchos sobre acceso a información y que cuando hay esos compromisos sobre acceso a información, no están todos los actores que tendrían que estar a saber sociedad civil y en ocasiones inclusive las instancias gubernamentales a cargo de la implementación de las regulaciones sobre acceso a información. Son esos, pues, nuestros dos objetivos, apoyar a los gobiernos en materia de acceso a información en el marco de AGP, uno, y dos, asegurar que todos los actores que tienen que estar, los actores re, 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 relevantes, forman parte de este esfuerzo. Let me ask now Kevin Dunion uh, to share with us uh, some very interesting information about um, Uh, the process of OGP and how is it assumed by relevant actors around access to information. You want to say? Okay. Easier. Okay. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Um, I just want to expand on what Juan Pablo has said and in particular to identify a, uh, a class of key stakeholders who've been Um, largely absent from the OGP process, and that is the oversight bodies um, which are often responsible for uh, interpreting and enforcing freedom of information laws, which often lie at the heart of uh, access to information and indeed the right to information which citizens uh, should enjoy. And I have a uh, passed as a Scottish Information Commissioner, but now much more pertinently um, working at the Centre for Freedom of Information in the University of Dundee. And as part of our work of trying to assist commissioners to um, share views and experience, we asked in preparation for this summit information about their engagement with the open government partnership process. And the results are interesting because Although 36% of the commissioners from OGP countries, OGP member countries, said they had uh, a significant involvement in OGP, that was almost entirely confined to commissioners from Latin America. 42% of commissioners said they had hardly any or no involvement whatsoever with the OGP process. And therefore, I think it's a, a, a missing key stakeholder group Uh, who should be engaged. Now, the question may be, um, why not? Are they simply not interested? Uh, do they not want to be involved? Well, quite to the contrary. Um, 79% of the commissioners said they wanted more involvement in the OGP. 21% said they wanted the same amount of involvement. But again, those are mostly the Latin American commissioners who are already heavily involved or even members of countries in the OGP uh, steering groups. So there's, a, there's a, 
a willingness, a lack of engagement, a willingness to be more engaged, and a degree of optimism. Um, the commissioners think that the OGP, uh, from what they read and from what they see, should lead to significantly more information being disclosed or moderately more information. So again, very strongly optimistic that the OGP could lead to something much better. And therefore, I see the benefit um, of this access to information working group, even at the most basic level, as being a means by which we can reach out to commissioners um, and get them engaged at a national level, explaining to them um, when action plans are being created, how they can get in touch with the uh, steering group within inside their, their, their country, when national action plans are being reviewed, who the independent review mechanism uh, reviewer is, and to make sure that they're part uh, of that process of review and assessment. Uh, and I think the benefit will be to bring in a powerful new constituency, many of whom are actually, or several of whom are represented here in this room, from the UK, from Scotland, from Canada, uh, from, from Chile, Brazil, and Mexico. We all have, all of those offices have their commissioners or representatives in this room, and to engage them in something purposeful. And I say that because I do believe that we should not be in reinventing the wheel. If we're talking about strengthening access to information, let's build upon the rights which have already been hard fought for and where commissioners are already upholding the rights or interpreting them. And even for something like open data, we've seen discussions about voluntary standards and codes of practice, uh, but in many countries, it should be possible to get access to data using the existing access to information laws or as here in the UK, for those laws to be amended to make specific provision for data sets. So um, not speaking on behalf of commissioners, but certainly at their recent conference in Berlin, they uh, strongly backed engagement in OGP, uh, and uh, I look forward to many of them taking part uh, through this working group. Thank you very much. Well, by the way, I should say to you, I've got several of these um, reports of the survey uh, sitting up here, so first come, first served, if you want a copy of them. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much and welcome to the Minister of Justice from Georgia who has just joined us. We'll be looking forward to hearing a few words from you shortly. So it's great to see everybody. Um, what an amazing group of people from all over the world. I think this is a testament to how many people really are invested in promoting the right of access to information and to assuring that it retains its centerpiece as part of the Open Government Partnership. Um, so it's great to see so many of you. We did yesterday have a number of you um, with us as we met for a working session. Um, it was a very vibrant, a very robust discussion. We came in with a few ideas and left with many, many more. And so what I'm going to do in the next two minutes is just present to you some ideas that emanated from yesterday. And over time, we hope to hear from you in the, in the course of this session your thoughts on these ideas and how we as a community can move this working group forward so that it is as uh, positive and as constructive as possible. One of the um, agreements that we had yesterday was on the value of taking this working group and really dividing it into subgroups that would be uh, based on either some themes or some moments, and I'll be talking about that shortly. Uh, but in addition to having agreement on the idea of having subgroups that each of you could select to be a part of, one or more, we did come up with what I'd like to say are five principles that would guide the functioning of each of these subgroups. Um, and these are in no particular order. Uh, so the first principle for the subgroups would be that they're inclusive of all stakeholders. So that they include both government bodies, uh, oversight bodies, as Kevin was just mentioning, and information commissioners, as well as civil society organizations uh, and uh, coalitions and, and private sector, all the people, media, who are involved in promoting the right to information. The second principle is that we would encourage dialogue that so much of the strength of open government partnership and the way that it's progressing is through dialogue and through sharing and through peer-to-peer -peer learning. And so we would be encouraging that dialogue throughout each of the working sub-working groups. The third point of the working groups is that they need to be concrete. We need to have very specific objectives for each of them, actions, results, and a clear time frame. So that in a year from now, when we come back together, uh, or two years from now, when we come back together at the next OGP summit, that we can see whether the working groups have had a positive effect. 
And the only way to do that is to make sure each subgroup is really clear on what they're meant to, uh, to be trying to achieve. And the fourth um, principle of these subgroups is that they would be supportive and responsive to both government and civil society needs so that we would be providing technical assistance through the subgroups, sharing different experiences, identifying good practices around access to information, what's working in countries, what's not working in countries. As government makes commitments, we want them to be building their commitments on the best practices that exist. Sometimes those are gonna be in a far off country that they may not know much about, but through the subgroup they can learn and hear about those good practices. And the fifth principle is that these subgroups need to be synergistic, that access to information doesn't exist in a bubble, um, that really access to information, I think most of us agree, is a framework for openness, for transparency, and for accountability, and as such, it really needs to be mainstreamed. So we would want each of the subgroups to be synergistic with each other, sharing their experiences throughout this subgroup, throughout this working group, but also with the other working groups. So as you probably know, you were forced to select whether to come to one on access to information or open data, or fiscal transparency or access to information, or open parliament or access to information. And our feeling is that really all of those include access to information. And so while we've developed this as a standalone uh, working group, we also want to make sure that whatever we do is being fed into those other groups and that they're aware of the work that's going on here and that, that again, it's being mainstreamed. With that, uh, with those five principles and just to, uh, they need to be inclusive, encourage dialogue, concrete, supportive and responsive, and synergistic. With that, we um, had thought about three potential subgroups, and we talked about these a bit last night. We're just putting these forward for consideration, and over time, in the next weeks, we hope to reach out to all of you and really define the subgroups. But as we thought about uh, open government partnership, we thought about it as a lifespan. And so initially, governments need to enter. They have to meet certain criteria to become a member of OGP. They need to then make commitments and action plans and they need to achieve those commitments and action plans. And so we thought that it made sense to consider working groups that met those three stages of life, so to speak, of the open government partnership. And so the first one might deal with issues of eligibility, perhaps giving recommendations when governments are trying to become eligible, looking at the criteria for eligibility, uh, and helping them to su support to meet the criteria. This morning, we heard from the government of Cote d'Ivoire that they're very interested in joining. We know they don't have an access to information law. How wonderful would it be to help them with that so that they could meet the eligibility criteria? The second area was around the commitments, and I think Juan Pablo mentioned that in reviewing these thousands of commitments that we hear so much about, there's really very few that are around access to information, and those that are existing are not perhaps the most ambitious as they could be. So one subgroup could work to support governments as they make their commitments um, or they do their recommitments. There's a number of countries now recommitting to really make those commitments as ambitious as possible given the context in which the country is, uh, the context of the country. And finally, we think it's important to help governments to achieve success in their access to information commitments. So the third subgroup would work with governments uh, with the commitments that they have, whether that's around developing or passing access to information laws, which a number of governments have committed to, or such as Tanzania this morning, um, or around implementation or enforcement. And for that reason, it's so great to have so many commissioners because they're really the ones that are gonna help the governments to meet those commitments um, that they're making through OGP. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it back to um, Juan Pablo, uh, we can talk more, I hope, around these subgroups, around what you would like to see this full working group do and your expectations for it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And this is uh, uh, just uh, a general proposal uh, out of the dialogue, the very f uh, fruitful dialogue that we had yesterday around these issues. And um, now what uh, we suggest to do is have um, uh, the people that are in the field working, pushing for, uh, making sure that the right to information is exerted, to share with us their experience and to uh, give us hints on their expectations for this group. 
We can do that by listening to um, Jorge Jaraquemada, President Commissioner of Chile, uh, then uh, the Minister from Georgia, who is here with us, then we can listen to uh, Minister Hage. If he finally shows up, we're waiting for him. We know he's here, he's in another working group, but he's coming. And then Moises can finish uh, the <coughs> presentations so we can have the section of questions and answers. So, Jorge, por favor. Como tú te sientes cómodo. I will speak in Spanish. Bien, mi, primeramente los agradecimientos por a, ser considerados como Consejo para la Transparencia en Chile en, en este panel. Eh, nosotros somos un organismo muy nuevo frente a las experiencias, por ejemplo, de Escocia, eh, incluso de México, somos un organismo muy Nobel, solamente llevamos cuatro años de vigencia. Y quiero señalar acá que para nosotros eh, el tema de la transparencia, acceso a la información, gobiernos abiertos, eh, se inscribe dentro de un proceso de reforma y modernización del Estado. Para nosotros fue un camino largo, lo comenzamos el año 93, con una iniciativa, 94 en realidad, con una iniciativa presidencial, una comisión presidencial que se abordó temas sobre prioridad y transparencia que finalmente no fructificó. Recién el año 2005 pudimos eh, realizar una reforma constitucional donde se consagraba la publicidad de los actos de la administración. Y posteriormente el año 2008 dictamos la ley de acceso a la información que rige desde el 2009. Me parece a mí que eh, nuestra participación como órgano garante, tanto en la red de este tipo de órganos en América Latina, como en nuestra participación en la Alianza de Gobiernos Abiertos, debe inscribirse eh, en una lógica de impulsar los ejes de transparencia, apertura, rendición de cuentas, accountability y de participación ciudadana. Y en ese sentido, nuestra propuesta de iniciativa para el Plan de Acción de Gobierno Abierto de Chile del año 2013 al 2014, que fue recogida en gran parte eh, por el Ejecutivo chileno, tiene, está destinada, yo diría yo, a tres grandes dimensiones. La primera es a generar capacidades institucionales, lo segundo al uso o usabilidad del derecho de acceso, y lo tercero, a una evaluación del impacto. ¿Por qué lo planteamos de esta manera? En términos de las capacidades institucionales, como decía, nosotros somos un órgano extraordinariamente joven en esto del acceso a la información, enfrentamos más bien una cultura de la opacidad en nuestros países, y por lo tanto, un gran desafío nuestro es instalar, posicionar el acceso a la información, primero como un derecho, y segundo, como un derecho que está garantizado, y tercero, que existe un órgano, que es el Consejo para la Transparencia, que precisamente su finalidad es eh, garantizar este, el ejercicio de este derecho. Y en este sentido, lo que nosotros hemos propuesto como plan de acción tiene que ver primero con la creación de un portal de transparencia del Estado de Chile. Deben saber ustedes que hay varios organismos públicos, algunos poderes del Estado en Chile, que en eso les aplica la ley de transparencia, la ley de acceso a la información, en plenitud algunos poderes autónomos, como es el caso del Congreso, como es el caso del Poder Judicial, como es el caso de la Contraloría General. 
Sin embargo, nuestra propuesta, a pesar de la autonomía de estos órganos, fue convocarlos, invitarlos, para que en un proceso de autorregulación suscribieran un convenio que estamos firmando por estos días para que todos los órganos del Estado, todos los poderes del Estado, aún aquellos que son autónomos, converjan en este gran portal de transparencia del Estado. Es decir, ofrecerle al ciudadano una plataforma única a través de la web para que pueda plantear sus solicitudes de acceso, pueda hacer un seguimiento de estas, pueda reclamar si es pertinente ante el Consejo y pueda seguir el trámite de su acción de amparo. Creemos también y hemos planteado que es importante avanzar en la transparencia activa, en aquello que los órganos públicos deben colocar proactivamente en sus sitios electrónicos. Hace cuatro años, o antes incluso cuando se discutió la ley, los estándares a que están obligados nuestros órganos públicos parecían adecuados. Hoy, en cambio, parecen muy insuficientes. Y es por eso que hemos planteado avanzar muy fuertemente en mayores estándares de transparencia activa. Incluso avanzar en lo que eh, en las experiencias internacionales se denomina transparencia proactiva, en una lógica también de datos abiertos. Permitiendo, eso sí, la usabilidad de los datos que van a ser disponibilizados por los órganos públicos, por los ciudadanos. Si usted coloca, doy un ejemplo, si usted coloca esos datos en un PDF, el ciudadano no puede usarlos. Si los coloca, en cambio, en otro tipo de soporte informático, el ciudadano podrá hacer todos aquellos cruces que le parezcan pertinentes. También nos parece que en este ámbito del fortalecimiento de las capacidades institucionales debe ponerse un foco en aquellos órganos públicos que en el caso de Chile son más débiles, cuáles son los gobiernos locales, municipios o municipalidades. Allí necesitamos hacer un foco muy importante, y lo estamos haciendo, entregándoles un soporte eh, relevante desde el punto de vista informático y desde el punto de vista de la capacitación para que puedan elevar su fortalecimiento, sus capacidades institucionales. Una segunda dimensión de nuestras propuestas al plan tiene que ver con el uso del derecho. Y en esto quiero decirles por qué hemos puesto tanto énfasis en esto. En Chile, en cuatro años de vigencia, Chile tiene una población de 17 millones de habitantes, en cuatro años de vigencia de la ley se han presentado alrededor de 180.000 solicitudes de información al gobierno central. Sin embargo, solamente 6.000 de esas personas han recurrido ante el Consejo. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Que los otros 174.000 solicitantes quedaron absolutamente conformes con la respuesta que se les dio, probablemente no sea así. Probablemente lo que ha sucedido es que esas personas no conocen la ley, no saben los procedimientos, no saben que es un derecho que está garantizado y que hay un órgano al cual pueden reclamar. Por lo tanto, un gran desafío nuestro es el posicionamiento de la ley. Fíjense ustedes que si pudiéramos perfilar, hacer el perfil de la persona que solicita información, es una mujer de edad madura, de bajos ingresos y bajo nivel educacional. Sin embargo, la persona que se ampara, o es decir, que reclama ante el Consejo para la Transparencia, es un hombre joven de nivel educacional universitario y de altos ingresos. Aquí hay un riesgo, el riesgo de elitización del derecho de acceso a la información. Y es por eso que el Consejo 
ha considerado como un primer gran desafío, y esto va más allá de la RTA y de las iniciativas de gobiernos abiertos, el posicionamiento masivo del derecho de acceso. Y es por eso que hace dos semanas, por ejemplo, hemos terminado una intensa campaña por televisión abierta y por prensa escrita para difundir a todos los ciudadanos que existe un derecho por el cual pueden reclamar ante el Consejo. Y la tercera dimensión que nosotros hemos propuesto en este plan de acción tiene que ver con la evaluación de los impactos. Nosotros no sacamos nada sin saber cómo estamos avanzando, si estamos siendo eficaces en la implementación de esta gran política pública que es la transparencia y de este derecho que es el acceso a la información. Fíjense ustedes que en Chile solamente un 11% de las personas conoce la ley de transparencia. Entiendo que en, France, en, en México es alrededor de un 30% y entiendo que en Escocia es alrededor de un 80%. Es decir, nos queda mucho por avanzar. Eh, y en esta evaluación de impacto nosotros estamos realizando muchos estudios y yo creo que aquí tenemos una posibilidad muy interesante como eh, red de transparencia y acceso a la información en América Latina. Nosotros hemos generado recientemente un estudio que le hemos llamado Índice de Transparencia y Acceso a la Información, que toma diversas encuestas y diversos estudios, por ejemplo, de cliente oculto y eh, estudios de fiscalización de cumplimiento de la ley de acceso, para integrarlos en una, en una herramienta que hemos llamado Índice de Transparencia y Acceso a la Información. ¿Qué notable sería que pudiéramos compartir similares estudios que pudieran ser replicados en otros países de América Latina de forma tal que así como, por ejemplo, existe el índice de libertad económica o el índice de desarrollo humano y que son comparables país a país, nosotros también pudiéramos tener un estándar de comparabilidad de la eficacia del acceso a la información en nuestros países. Muy bien, muchas gracias por haberme escuchado y muy amables. Let me welcome now Minister of Justice of Georgia. I'm sorry about the bad pronunciation of your name, Thea Sulukiani. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to address you to this first meeting of the Access to Information Working Group at this annual summit. Adhering to the core values and principles of OEGP, one of the main priorities of the Georgian government is to ensure freedom of information and more transparency in public sector. Freedom of information legislation of Georgia is very liberal, setting high standards for administrative state agencies. For example, the legislation provides for the obligation to respond immediately to the public information requests and the maximum time limit to provide response to such requests has been set by law at 10 days which is one of the shortest periods in the freedom of information legislation around the world. In order to move forward, the National Action Plan of Georgia and Open Government 2012-2013 set the commitment of the government to ensure proactive publication of information of high public interest on the websites of each state agency as well as to create a possibility of electronic request of public information. These commitments have now been implemented. To increase the standards of freedom of information and implement this commitment in practice, the obligation of state agencies to proactively publish public information and provide the mechanism for electronic requests 
became requirements of Georgian legislation in 2012. The amendments to the relevant freedom of information legislation entered into force on September the 1st this year. Dedicated to enforce implementation of the OGP commitments and address the issue of freedom of information, this year the government of Georgia requested the Ministry of Justice to develop the list of public information to be published proactively by each state agency. As a result of collaborative process and consultations among the stakeholders concerned, and based mainly on the recommendations from the civil society, the draft decree on electronic request and proactive publication of public information was elaborated at the Ministry of Justice. Presented before the cabinet, the decree was adopted by the government of Georgia and entered into force on September the 1st this year as well. The decree establishes specific regulations in relation to proactive disclosure of public information, foresees a requirement of public agencies to create a system for registration and confirmation of public information requests received and provides the list of information subject to proactive publication. The list of information to be published proactively contains seven categories of information. Information on human resources, public procurement and privatization, state financing and expenditures, public services and fees, tariffs and rates established by the administrative body concerned, as well as information on legislative acts adopted or related to the functions of that state agency. In August this year, the Ministry of Justice submitted to the Government of Georgia recommendations on the necessary measures for implementations of electronic request and proactive publication of information, proposals on the necessary measures to ensure civic engagement in decision-making process of central as well as local government activities, and recommendations on the legislative amendments in relations to access to public information. Prepared as a result of collaborative process and extensive consultations among the government agencies and non-governmental sector, and taking into account international standards and best practices, these proposals and recommendations adopted by the government of Georgia encourage the national dialogue in relation to the freedom of information and provide new and ambitious ideas to incentivize the government agencies of Georgia. Worth noting that elaboration of the decree and the recommendations for the government is the example of strong and powerful collaboration between the so civil society and government to achieve desired results of transparency and accountability by increasing the standards of freedom of information legislation to, in Georgia. We also take pride that Georgia's achievements on freedom of information legislation, proactive publication and e-requests have been highlighted at the OGP summit here in London and we are competing for the Bright Spots Prize among six other selected inspiring examples of how open and accountable government is changing actually people's lives. Importantly, civil society representatives of Georgia nominated this project to compete for Bright Spots Prize. Despite these significant steps forward to more open government and accessible public information, we would like to go even further. First, by introducing a separate Freedom of Information Act with the supervising authority. And second, putting into operation open data portal, data.gov.g. The portal will represent public information database, single portal, which would allow citizens to easily access proactively publish public information find different data sets produced by public institutions as well as submit 
e request for public information to any governmental agency and receive from that portal responses electronically. We realize that this is the commitment which cannot be fully implemented overnight. However, we are committed to launch the website later this year, and as of next year, the, the web page will be filled with different information and e-request system will be incorporated in the portal as well. Further well, work should continue during next years to add more information to make this portal updatable one and to put into that data sets available in different government agencies. Of course, our commitment to openness is now even stronger because as we say it in Georgia, we have nothing to hide in the government and we strive to continue our efforts towards truly open, participatory, collaborative and accountable government thanks to outside help from the civil society. We reaffirm our strong will to continue to be the active partner in the OGP and contribute to these unique processes of experience sharing, healthy and engaging competition of the governments to open up empower citizens and advance the values of modern democratic governments. To work of this, uh, the work of this particular group, working group, uh, will facilitate for us the process of elaboration of new Freedom of Information Act back home, uh, which has already started. We stand ready to support the work from our side of this working group with, among others, um, things to be, shared, to be shared from Georgian side, as for example, the public call service, which is a unique experience of Georgia. And when we mention best practices to be shared from other countries, I definitely recommend that this best, Georgian best practice be taken from us whilst we share experiences coming from other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Let me welcome now Jorge Haji, uh, one of the <coughs> most relevant uh, promoters uh, and fathers of uh, the Open Government Partnership. It's an uh, honor to have you here. Bienvenido. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words of introduction. I want to congratulate with Mexico and other partners in the OGP for the creation of this working group specifically devoted to the theme of access to information. And uh, I will just briefly here uh, bring to you some information about uh, our efforts in Brazil in order to show perhaps to other interested countries how can one nation with no tradition in openness of information, in transparency, in access to information in a relatively short period of time, progress and uh, make some uh, important achievements in this area. As long as you have political decision, political will to do it, and uh, an agency uh, acting in a daily basis, uh, influencing the whole of the government, because the govern governments in general are not monolithical, are not homogeneous, are very heterogeneous, especially when it comes to transparency, but with some effort of coordination and uh, training, uh, you can do it. In Brazil, we had some, some initiatives already in the area of what we call uh, active transparency. What I mean to, by active, active transparency is the publishing of information uh, that the government considers of public interest, spontaneous publication of data. 
uh, we started doing this uh, about 10 years ago, especially with our transparency portal, which displays uh, an enormous amount of fiscal information about the budget execution, the collection of revenues, and the expenses. Uh, today we do it in a daily basis. I mean, all the federal expenditures made until last night are in the internet in this morning for any person in the world without password, username, nothing. Uh, absolutely easy and free and uh, in a citizen language, not in a technical language. This portal, uh, our Brazilian portal, uh, had last year uh, 8 million and 500,000, uh, uh, 8 million and 500,000 accesses, which uh, for an initiative of four, uh, eight years ago uh, is some uh, important progress as we understand. But we did not have a legislation on access to information for the other side of transparency that we call passive transparency. Transparency by demand. When the citizen says that he wants to know this specific document that is not already exposed by the government. And this was the new area for us. We started uh, with a law approved in the November of 2011 came uh, into effective um, in May of last year, 2012. We had only six months to prepare, to prepare the administration uh, to respond to all the, the demands. And uh, we, we think we, we did it. It was not easy. Uh, the idea was to facilitate at the maximum degree the, the requests, do not uh, asking for more than the, the minimum necessary identification of the, the person requesting the information. The only thing that he has to give us is his email to get the, the answer, and uh, we, we don't uh, ask for anything else in order to, to make it uh, easier at the maximum degree possible. They don't have to motivate why they want the information. All the, all the requests have to be answered in 20 days or at the maximum uh, the, 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 the administration has 10 days more, which means 30 days at the maximum, and the answers are being given in an average of 12 days, almost a third of the maximum admitted by the law. This be, uh, is possible because we uh, emphasize the training uh, to build capacity in the administration in order to be prepared for this. And also because we develop an electronic system which makes it easier for the citizen to request information and for us to monitor the information. We know at any moment from our office of the Controller General, we know uh, how many informations were requested every day uh, how many days the, this or that agency is delaying the, the answer, and what is the, the situation at any given moment. I'm not sure I can read what is in this moment shown in the screen, but I am assuming uh, that I am in the slide of main activities, and I want to go to the next one. 
overview of the commitments uh, presented by Brazil in the first action plan for the OGP, uh, the commitments related to access to information. They are shown there in the screen. And I want to go a bit quicker to the next one. Training and education numbers as the, perhaps the most important measure in the preparation of the administration uh, in order to implement this new law. The results within six months after the approval of the law before uh, entry into force, we prepared about 6,000 uh, public servants in uh, distance courses and specific training of, of the public servants who were going to work in the service uh, of information to the citizen, directly dealing directly with this problem. We prepared 700 uh, public servants with this. And we distributed uh, manuals, handbooks, and all sorts of orientation also. The main features of the electronic system that we have developed are for the citizens, the request of information they can do to any federal government without leaving his residence or his post of work. He can do it by the internet. If he wants to go directly, he will find the, the place to make the, his request at the at the entrance of any public federal agency. Uh, the track status of the requests are observed at any moment by himself. He receives the response to, uh, by the same means that he, he sends the, the request. He can evaluate the quality of the response received. He can appeal to the hierarchy authority immediately above the, the public servant if the information was denied or if the information was not completely the way he wanted. He, he can make an appeal with no cost. It's just one click, nothing else. And uh, uh, the, he can also have access to statistic reports on the requests and appeals. The next one gives you an idea of the site of the electronic system with uh, the place where you do your login and make the request. And in the, in the next one, you have uh, just the, the screen to show the, re the registering, uh, to make the consult and request and the file. Now, more Uh, after about 18 months of uh, the presentation, I have to choose the, <laughs> the microphone and see what's being shown. Anyway, anyway, I'll try to do both. Uh, we have had in 18 months of experience. Uh, about 128,000 requests. The average uh, response time, as I said, is around 12 days. Uh, it could be up to 30 days. It's been 12 days. It's a, a, a very important answer to people uh, who used to say that uh, it would not be possible in our country with no tradition in this area 
to implement this law in six months. But it is possible. Uh, it's enough to have the political will and the administrative uh, dedication to this. You do it. Uh, the number of, uh, uh, or the percentage, I have one minute, I'll try to summarize. Uh, the average of, uh, per the percentage of answers is 96% of the, the requests have already been answered. And of these, about 80% are positive answers. And we have a percentage of appeals not superior to 6%, which means that 94% of the cases, the citizen is well satisfied with the, with the answer he received. Because if he did, he did not appeal, it's because he did not want to appeal, because it costs nothing, just one click in the system in the internet. The, the percentage of uh, information really denied is about 10%. The other cases are other situations where the information does not exist or it's not within the function of that specific agency. Uh, as I have only 30 seconds in order to <laughs> conclude, I will, I will just let the presentation here uh, with the organization, and I, ask, I, I will ask the organization to expose it in the, in the site to be at the whole complete disposition of uh, uh, anyone interested. Those are some uh, examples of the use by the press, by the media of the new law. The journalists making a reference of how they obtained that information by means of the law of access to information. In, in all these examples, the, the credit was granted to the new law by the journalist responsible for the, for the news. And finally, uh, this is a study, a comparative study made uh, by the, the network uh, where we, we are very happy with our second position, second only to Mexico in those Latin American countries uh, evaluated uh, in, a, in a survey, uh, in a survey about the, the different aspects which were uh, examined in this, in this survey uh, that were barriers, if there are many barriers to the access of information, excessive of the meaning of, uh, of uh, information from the citizen or not, compliance with the legal uh, deadlines, and quality of the responses. Of course, we need to more time in order to advance more, but I also have to finalize here one information uh, whose responsible is present here uh, in the table, uh, the study of uh, Professor Kevin uh, Donion uh, in this study of uh, the information commissioner's experience where the average time to judge the appeals, our country is in the second uh, stratus uh, of the of his study, uh, which for us uh, newcomers in the in this field is sufficiently good. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm sorry for the time that I exceeded. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the three experiences that have been presented to us 
besides how interesting are each of them, show us clearly that if we share our experiences, if we communicate, there is a big deal that we can learn from each other. I think that we, we didn't plan it this way, but the fact of having Chile, Georgia, and Brazil shows of the need of um, uh, 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 more uh, permanent and fruitful communication among this community of access to information um, uh, stakeholders. So uh, what are the next steps? Uh, Moises is gonna uh, talk uh, in two or three minutes, so we have a chance for uh, answer, uh, questions and answers. Este, puedo elegir, y empiezo y ya tengo un minuto, ¿sí? ¿Cómo va disminuyendo? Este, eh, yo le cuento la interna, que hay un reloj que a uno lo apresura. Yo quiero partir diciendo que eh, tener un working group de acceso a la información es un logro muy importante. Desde que comenzó GP hubo una discusión respecto del peso que tenía el derecho de acceso a la información pública dentro de las discusiones generales de gobierno abierto. Se generan algunos debates y parte de la generación de este grupo tiene que ver con esa historia. Una historia en la cual no siempre los órganos garantes fueron considerados actores relevantes dentro del acceso a la información, donde no siempre este derecho era considerado en los planes de acción y creo que hasta el día de hoy por ahí hay dificultad en torno a eso. Y también eh, la necesidad de establecer, por otro lado, diálogos equitativos y paritarios entre la sociedad civil y los estados. Creo que ahí hay tres puntos que son claves para entender por qué nace este Working Group, cuál es el sentido y hacia dónde vamos. Yo no quiero decir cuáles son los próximos pasos, sino más bien recordar o trazar algunos senderos que ustedes mismos los tienen que ir completando, puesto que la idea es justamente hacer un trabajo compartido y paritario. Quiero recordar la experiencia de una reunión de OGP que se hizo en Latinoamérica, en Chile, en enero de este año, donde eh, se lograron superar las diferencias metodológicas que existían entre Estado y la sociedad civil para generar una discusión al mismo nivel, con un lenguaje llano, eh, directo. Muchos representantes de los Estados que estuvieron en Chile están hoy día sentados acá y los working group son parte también de esa lógica de trabajo y tienen que, de alguna manera, representar el sentido de ese diálogo paritario. Por eso en esta mesa de coordinación se encuentran representantes de la sociedad civil, representantes de Estado, órganos garantes, etc. Yo voy a hablar desde la sociedad civil. Yo voy a hablar desde las redes de acceso a información que existen hoy en día y de la necesidad que estas redes se puedan incluir de manera efectiva en el Working Group. Eso es parte importante del éxito de este grupo de trabajo. Si doy una simple mirada, en esta sala ya encuentro redes importantes que podrían generar un gran aporte a este grupo de trabajo. Veo ahí a Gilbert de eh, la red AFIC, la red de africana de acceso a la información, que tiene una gran, gran cantidad de organizaciones. Este, a, a Victoria, que está por ahí también, de Access Info, que son las redes europeas. También veo a Follanet una red mundial que ustedes ya conocen y que tiene una, un gran nivel de actividad a nivel de eh, cibernético, digamos, y de mantenernos en comunicación. Y por supuesto también veo a Transparencia Internacional representada por muchos capítulos, de los cuales yo veo como todos asienten, eh, y que forman parte de una dinámica de redes que es importante que se pueda ir incluyendo en las dinámicas de trabajo de este Working Group. Cuando me dice, y conversando con Juan Pablo, me dice, mira, quiero que te refieras acerca de los próximos pasos y acerca de la gobernabilidad, las reglas del juego. La verdad yo no estoy en condiciones de decirla, sino más bien de generar algunas líneas orientadoras de lo que nos parece en función de la discusión de ayer, que es lo que se debiera seguir. Lo primero es que entender que este grupo de trabajo es un grupo abierto, que requiere la participación de todos los actores, la inclusión de la experiencia de todas las redes importantes, porque ahí hay experiencias claves, relevantes, en materia de acceso a la información, de que la inclusión de esta sociedad civil sea hecha conforme a ciertos criterios eh, que permitan un orden y una secuencia y una metodología que permita que todas estas redes puedan hacer sus aportes dentro de este grupo de trabajo de una manera totalmente coordinada y sistemática. 
que se respete el mérito y el trabajo de cada una de ellas y que por pues, sobre todo también se respeten lo, los trabajos locales que muchas organizaciones de activistas que se encuentran también presentes hoy día realizan en sus propios países. Ese es un desafío del Working Group. También la articulación con otro tipo de redes como la red de órganos garantes, la RTA que también fueron, fue mencionada en este grupo de trabajo y que fue un, también uno de los impulsores de esta iniciativa. Siendo así, yo quisiera eh, simplemente decir que eh, desde la sociedad civil y desde la Alianza Regional, red a la cual represento en este grupo de coordinación, que es una red de 23 organizaciones de 19 países de América, eh, lo que nosotros vemos es una fuerte necesidad de poder generar mecanismos claros y reglas del juego eh, que sean lo suficientemente cierta y lo suficientemente clara para que todos sepan de qué manera pueden participar en este grupo de trabajo. Para ello, lo relevante es generar, y esta es la propuesta de próximos pasos que surgió en la discusión del día de ayer, generar un plan de trabajo. Un plan de trabajo que genere toda, que considere todas estas reflexiones, que las sistematice, que sea elaborado por todos los coordinadores de este grupo de trabajo y que después también, respetando esa lógica paritaria, pueda ser compartido con todos aquellos que después formen parte de este grupo. Hoy día no sabemos exactamente cómo se va a organizar, de qué manera la coordinación va a tener una relación con los demás integrantes del grupo de trabajo, y eso es parte de un segundo punto de este plan, que es la, el gobierno interno de esta red. ¿Cómo se va a coordinar? ¿Cómo se van a generar los sistemas de coordinación ¿Van a existir o no sistemas rotativos eh, de eh, eh, coordinación en este tipo de actividades? Son preguntas que son legítimas que se tengan que hacer y que también es importante que se puedan responder. Desde la sociedad civil han existido una serie de reflexiones respecto del funcionamiento del GP en el marco de las reuniones previas a esta cumbre. La mayor parte de ellas tiene que ver con desafíos institucionales de la Alianza por el Gobierno Abierto. Los working group no pueden sentirse al margen de esos desafíos institucionales. Esta es una gran oportunidad de poder considerar todas esas reflexiones e incorporarlas dentro de este plan de trabajo en, un, en una propuesta de gobierno y de eh, gobernanza interna de los working group. También cómo se van a validar este plan de trabajo. Creo que hay un desafío también en saber cuál va a ser la metodología para validar este plan de trabajo ante los distintos stakeholders con los cuales este grupo se va a relacionar tanto a nivel de América, África, Europa y otros continentes. Y por último, respetando ya los minutos porque el reloj ya me está apurando y me siento un poco presionado, eh, un tema que no es menor, un tema que es tremendamente importante para los efectos de poder incluir a la mayor cantidad de organizaciones y a la mayor cantidad también de representantes de órganos garantes y otros actores importantes en este grupo, que es el factor idiomático. Es importante que no exista una única lengua oficial, sino de que existan diversas lenguas en las cuales podamos expresarnos y en las cuales podamos compartir nuestras ideas. Y eso implica un desafío para el grupo de trabajo que hoy día se ha resuelto por la vía de la traducción simultánea, pero que en otras oportunidades también va a representar un desafío tanto en términos económicos, organizativo y financiero. Creo que ese punto va a ser tremendamente relevante para que las organizaciones de América se puedan sentir realmente incluidas y todos tengan la oportunidad de expresar su opinión y las organizaciones y redes de otros continentes que tal vez hablan otros idiomas también puedan sentirse lo suficientemente incluidas en este proceso. Con eso simplemente quiero dar las gracias a los organizadores, especialmente al IFAI, por tener esta iniciativa de impulsar este grupo de trabajo hasta esta fecha. Y eh, dicho eso, simplemente le dejo la palabra a Juan Pablo Guerrero y reitero los agradecimientos. Muchas gracias, Juan Pablo. Sí. Gracias. Thank you, Moisés. Colegas, it's uh, time to finish. Um, many of uh, uh, us have other engagements. Let's just take uh, five minutes to first say that uh, we do have uh, your uh, names if you did express interest in this working group. So uh, we have a list that we will circulate with all of you who expressed interest into coming to this session. 
Secondly, if um, uh, you haven't done it, expressing this interest, please uh, uh, send um, a, an email uh, to the following address so we can make sure that uh, we join you as potential members of this working group. And uh, uh, it's uh, my name, basically. Juan Pablo, uh, it's in one word, and then forget about this last name, dot Guerrero. At, and then it's I F I A, if I dot org, O R G dot I F A I. Sorry, I already done for you, but <laughs> but let me let me take let me take uh, three questions from the from the. Audience, please. Jorgen Liashvili from Institute of Development of Freedom of Information, Georgia. First of all, I would like to thank to all the presenters for their brilliant presentations. Uh, I have I have a question. Uh, I think to. Uh, mostly should be responded from Kevin Dunian. It's about the supervising body on freedom of information. As Minister of Justice of Georgia said, uh, we, were, we are planning to work on the uh, reform of freedom of information in Georgia, legisla legislative reform. And uh, it will be concerning also the body, supervising body on freedom of information. I would like to ask you what will be, there are different practical uh, implementation of the supervising body, and I would like to hear what will be the main recommendation, what kind of model will be ideal for Georgia. Thank you. Uh, okay, the, the task here is to now deal with this in seconds, and without having seen your law, but the, the best profile, of course, is a commissioner who has the ability to uh, first of all, as a commissioner, has the ability to issue decisions which uh, can be uh, uphold, upheld in law. So not just advice to the government, but uh, to say this is what must happen. And um, but one of the big tasks is to make sure that the, the body is adequately resourced because many commissioners who speak to me, especially new commissioners, they have good laws but almost no money to do their job and therefore delays happen uh, when appeals are being received and the credibility of the law and the credibility of the commissioner is undermined. But I'm more than happy, one of the functions of the Centre for Freedom of Information is to exactly have this dialogue, so please do so afterwards and then I can put you in touch with relevant commissioners whose legislation looks similar to yours. Toby, one microphone there, and we can, if we can have another one. Hmm? Thank you. Sí. Eh, Edison Lanza de Uruguay, de Sociedad Civil, también de la Alianza Regional. Eh, no, para todos los que trabajamos en, en acceso a la información desde hace años, la conformación de este grupo de trabajo realmente es una muy buena noticia. Eh, Quiero decirles que escuchar experiencias puntuales me parece bien interesante siempre para todos y para eh, conocer cómo avanza el acceso a la información en, otros, en distintos países. Pero mi pregunta es si en este eh, grupo de trabajo podemos trascender las experiencias puntuales de, de cada eh, órgano garante y, y podemos de acuerdo, construir eh, juntos algunos estándares para ayudar a todos los países que forman OGP, que tienen que avanzar en acceso a la información pública, tienen que generar compromisos y tienen que cumplirlos. En, en, bueno, en algunos estándares sobre el camino que debe seguir un país que no tiene ley, un país que sí tiene ley y que tiene que implementar esa ley, y este, cuál sería la metodología para construir esos acuerdos entre sociedad civil y gobierno, teniendo en cuenta que este es un derecho muy especial. de los gobiernos. 
Gracias. Uh, we are going to uh, finish now. We have a, a huge uh, amount of pressure giving uh, uh, that we run out of time. Uh, we will follow up uh, sending you an email uh, once we get uh, the list of uh, all the people interested uh, where uh, we're going to give for you a proposal on next steps that will include pr precisely the way we're going to be communicating, how are we going to be uh, making decisions, uh, but more importantly, what uh, subgroups we're going to be forming so you can join them and uh, we will be facilitating the, the ways for communication. I thank you very much for your presence. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Toby. Uh, please take, uh, if, if you're interested, some of the reports that Kevin is uh, putting for you, and also Laura has some information for you to share. Thank you. Toby.